part two of our series, Not Just Another Love Story, and we're walking through the book of Ruth. And it's an amazing book. And the thing that I realized this week, and you may or may not have realized this before, but this really got my attention this week, is the book of Ruth is about three single people. Three single people. Naomi is an older single woman who is now a widow. Ruth is a single woman who is also a widow, but she's probably, researchers believe, in her mid to late 20s, maybe 30s, but probably more like 20s. Boaz is a single, successful business owner, probably in his mid-30s, maybe 40s. And so get this picture. Ruth and Boaz begin a relationship. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And it becomes an example of what romantic relationships are supposed to be like. And I think this is a beautiful love story, but it's not just a love story. And, And really where I want us to go today is I want to push to the surface a question And then we're going to see how this plays out with some real strong biblical principles that not just apply to romantic relationships, but apply to all areas of our lives. So if you're sitting here thinking, well, I'm not a single, it doesn't matter. It's going to apply to you too. If you're a single in the room, you better be ready to take notes because God's going to speak to your life today. So this question that comes to the surface is how should a single man and a single woman be involved in a romantic relationship? Hmm. I mean, the way that we do Romantic relationships in our culture is normal to us, but it's different in in other cultures. I don't know if you've ever been to other cultures. It's different. Most cultures globally do not do romantic relationships, dating and marriage, like we do in the West, like we do in the United States. And it's definitely not the way um, the Bible presents relationships. And it's totally different, really, than the way romantic relationships were experienced in the past, even in the United States. It's different today. How many of you know romantic relationships are different today than they were in the It is. It's different today. I mean, throughout history, throughout cultures, throughout the Bible, there are really three ways, to, to, to simplify this, three ways to become involved in a romantic relationship. On one side, you have the arranged marriage. Um, This is an interesting one. All the singles in the room are going, no, 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 no. We don't want to talk about that, right? This is where the parents or the family decide who you will date, who you will marry. And I bet most singles are saying, that's a terrible idea. We don't want to go there, right? On the other side, we have modern dating, which we have today in our culture, where the single person decides on their own who they will have a romance with, who Um, you know, where two single people date, marry without, pretty much without the involvement of their family in the decision making. Um, Somewhere in the middle, though, we would have what's called courtship. Now, before you write this off or jump on this bandwagon one way or the other, can I tell you right up front, this word um, has, I think, really been misinterpreted in our culture. There are some people who are strongly against it because they feel it's too confining, mainly single people. There are lots of people who are for it, believing that it gives control to parents, okay? Again, mainly parents (laughs) that would feel that way. I think it is misinterpreted in so many different ways. It, it, uh, in recent years, courtship has been defined as dating only one person and marrying that one person. And I'm not quite sure that's what this is talking about. Now, you may push back on me and you may want to talk to me afterwards. That's fine. I'm up for that. But I don't think that's what it is. In the in, in past and in the Bible, courtship is a balance. This is the thing that I want us to get. It's a balance between the single person and the family coming together somewhere in the middle, the single person having the choice through the counsel of the family. To me, that's what courtship is. Choice with counsel. Everybody follow me on that? And I think that's really important for us. If you're a single person, listen to me. You need to have counsel in your life. You don't just have a choice. You need to have wisdom. And I believe that God can use people in your life to bring wisdom in to your your decision making and the choices that you make. On the flip side, If you're a parent, grandparent, or concerned citizen of a single person, listen, they have a choice. Did you hear me? 
They have a choice. You can't pick the person for them. Now, I say that with some history. I um, was honestly considering getting out of a relationship that I was in. This is way back. And uh, I'll never forget sitting in my bedroom, on my bed. I was living with my folks at the time. And my dad comes walking in, and he has a picture. My dad was involved in our church choir. And the church choir had had a, uh, a party of some kind a couple of weeks prior. And this is the day when you had to, you know, take your film and get it developed, you know, all that kind of thing. And, and so he had taken some pictures at this church party, and he had developed some pictures. And he specifically developed this one picture. And he comes walking into my bedroom, and he says, hey, this is the girl you should be dating. And he throws this picture onto my bed. And he walks out of my room. I, I'm dating somebody, pretty serious, was engaged, actually, and my dad throws this picture on my bed. Now, as a young adult, I was all about choice and not about counsel, I'll just be honest with you, and I pretty much was like, Psh, what do you know? I've been married to the lady now for 35 years. He threw... Dee Dee's picture, my wife now, threw her picture onto my bed. And when I was putting my ideas and thoughts together for this study today, I, I couldn't get past that pic. I still have that picture. I couldn't get past the picture of the fact that, did my dad know something? I, he knew her in choir. They actually used to stand next to each other when they were in choir together. He just thought she was a great girl and should be his daughter-in-law, you know, kind of thing. And anyway, I, I could go on and on about this, but I think, I think we have lost something in this process. Courtship is not a bad thing, singles. Um, it doesn't have to be. And parents, we can't control. We have to give choice, but we can give counsel. Um, from personal experience, the times that I, in, I didn't enjoy relationships in my past, the times when I got hurt, the times when I hurt other people, the times when I found myself involved in things that I knew I shouldn't be involved in and I didn't want in my life, these happened when I tried to do the dating thing on my own without counsel, not listening to anybody. And I think the best way to navigate romantic relationships is with the help, with the counsel of, of people who love you, people who want the best for you, people who are in your corner, um, and at the same time, people who have a relationship with God, and they are desiring to have his plan in your life, not telling you what that is, just wanting you to find that. Now, you may not realize it, but in our culture, dating is somewhat new, um, these are some ideas that I, I've been listening to a pastor named Mark Driscoll who has a, a lot about this, and it's so good. This, this idea, this word dating, actually was first used in the 1920s. I'll give you some history here. Prior to that, prior to the 1920s, courting was common in our culture where a young man was part of a, uh, I'm sorry, a young woman was part of a loving family. The young man would spend time with that family, hang out with that family, probably at their home. Um, he would be with her. He would get to know her. He would get to know their family. Um, the whole family would get to know the young man. And when he and the young man, as the, uh, uh, young woman, as they would get to know each other, trust would be built, not just between them, but between the whole family. But early in the 1900s, women's magazines hit the market, hit the U.S. culture. And I'm not against women's magazines. I'm not against magazines, period. But the, the point is, these magazines became influential in women's lives. They began telling single women, wear these clothes, wear this makeup, do this, do that, do certain things, and single, uh, single men will find you attractive. And so this launched an entire industry that we even see today, an entire industry that pushes single women in a certain direction, always trying to attract single men. That's the purpose. In the 1920s, our culture was urbanized. More cities were developed. 
Um, in the cities, there were public gathering places, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, speakeasies, movie theaters, dance halls, all of these things. And so the focus, don't miss this, the focus of social relationships between men and women moved from the home to public places. And then we had automobiles come into the picture, which even gave us greater mobility. It changed everything. And so now a young man would drive his car to a young woman's home, not to spend time with the family, but to pick her up and take her on a night on the town, dinner, dancing, movie, whatever you want to do. That's basically how dating was established in our culture. So it's a fairly new idea, concept. And then we fast forward to today, right? I mean, when the majority of adults are single in our country, I don't know if you knew that, Majority of adults are single. And we idolize shows like The Bachelor, where women compete doing whatever to win a man. And we think, oh, that's normal. Is it? Hmm. Is that how relationships are supposed to work? Is that how romantic relationships are supposed to work? Now, if you watch The Bachelor, that's between you and you. I mean, it's not has nothing to do with me, right? But historically, culturally, biblically, listen. That's not normal. Hmm. And we know many relationships around us haven't worked. We've been in relationships that haven't worked, right? And so for those of us who are single, you need to ask yourselves, what do I believe about dating? Hmm. Apart from social media opinions, which how many of you know Instagram, Facebook, all, they, they have a lot of opinions about dating. Uh, apart from TV culture, movie culture, movie industry, apart from these influences, what do I believe about dating? As a single, you need to ask yourself, what, uh, who rather will I seek for counsel about dating? Listen, peers, friends, they probably don't know any more than you do. Not a good choice. I would recommend, highly recommend, you find somebody older, farther down the road, wiser, that's been through it, who is a trusted source, somebody in your corner, somebody who loves you, somebody who loves God, those are the people to listen to. And if you're a Jesus follower, single, if you're a Jesus follower, you need to ask, what does God say about dating? What can I learn from dating, about dating from the Bible? And so, You say, Bart, what are you getting at? I think this is why the book of Ruth is so applicable today. I think the book of Ruth speaks right into our culture. Written thousands of years ago, and yet here it is, a real story about real people going through real issues, and here it is applying to 2020, right? It's amazing. Last week we left off with a severe famine that had hit the land, and struggling in Bethlehem, Naomi's husband moved their family to Moab. Away from God's provision, away from God, away from God's people. And not too long after they moved to Moab, guess what? Naomi's husband died. We talked about that last week. You know, go on our uh, podcast, go on YouTube and catch it on our channel. But it it was a terrible time. It was devastating to, to Naomi. Naomi's sons married Moabite women, which of course would happen. And then guess what? Naomi's sons died. So then Naomi hears that God is blessing his people again. So these three heartbroken widows, no money, no food, no hope, they decide to go back to Judah, to Bethlehem, where Naomi is from. One of her daughter-in-laws, she decides to stay. So she stays in Moab, but there's one, Ruth, who decides, I'm going to stay at your side. And that's who this book is written about. It's, it's completely about her. And in their conversation, Ruth expresses her faith in God, the, the God of Israel, Yahweh, Jehovah God. And, and what happens is it says, Naomi returned, Ruth chapter 1, returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law Ruth. They arrived in Bethlehem, get this, at the beginning of the barley harvest. And we read right past that because we're not an agriculture society, but we, we read right past that not thinking about how important this is. Now in Bethlehem, again, in the land of Judah, God is blessing his people and they're having a harvest. That means food is there. 
God's blessing, God's provision is there. And they're coming in on that. It's the beginning of a whole new season, not just for the area, a whole new season for Naomi and Ruth. And so we pick up in chapter 2, and we're going to spend today really talking about chapter 2. Take a look. If you've got your Bible, if you've got a mobile device, you can use your outline. Hopefully you got that out, ready to go, or on the screens. We'll take a look at it. Let's read it together. It says, now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named, come on, say it with me, Boaz. I love that name. Bo, he's a good man right here. Who was a relative of Naomi's husband, Elimelech. Now, sometimes the English language doesn't quite convey the meaning of a Hebrew word. If you don't know, the Old Testament Jewish scriptures was originally written in Hebrew, a little bit of Aramaic, and then translated into English. But sometimes Hebrew can't be clearly, it's lost in translation, can't be clearly um, uh, shared in our English language. And right here we have a word that is saying that Boaz is wealthy and influential in the city. And that's the way we take it. And we think of money and we think of power, right? I mean, those are the two things that we're thinking of. He is an influential person and he's wealthy. But the Hebrew word, the word is gabor. And it, and it really, to be honest, doesn't have anything to do with money or influence. I mean, kind of. It's, it's there. But it really means champion, hero, mighty man, strong man. You know what it implies? That Boaz was physically impressive. Mm, good looking man right there. Right? That's what it's talking about. But then it also means that he had noble character. Same phrase is used in the Bible in Judges 11, uh, verse 1. It says that this particular person was a mighty man of valor, a great warrior. Boaz is the epitome of a phrase that we use quite often, a knight in shining armor. This is Boaz. Did you know his name literally means, in him is strength? Or you could like summarize it and say, strong one. That's what Boaz means. You want to have a good name for a boy right there, man. Strong one. He is a man's man. Boaz is the hero. He's wealthy. He's influential. And ladies, he is single. He's single. Wouldn't you like to have a guy like that? Find a guy like that? Let's pick up the narrative. Verse 2. One day, Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go out in the harvest, uh, into the harvest fields to pick up the stalks of grain left behind anyone who is kind enough to let me do it. Naomi replied, all right, my daughter, go ahead. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. Now keep in mind, they have nothing. They're flat broke. The, the fridge is empty. And Ruth didn't move all the way from Moab to Bethlehem to starve to death. And so she decides, look, I'm not just going to sit and let things happen. I'm going to get involved in changing our destiny. But this is more than just taking it, uh, initiative here. I see, and we should see, that there's a trust in God. The fact that she even, mean, even mentions, rather, the idea of you know, picking up stocks, of gleaning behind harvesters, what this shows, and we're going to see it in just a minute, is that Ruth believed that God was with them and that God would provide what they need. See, long before Naomi or Ruth ever had a need, God established a law for his people, the people of Israel. And we find it in Leviticus 19. Take a look. When you, God says to his people, when you harvest your crops, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners who live among you, for I, the Lord, am your God. I've heard it once said that God says don't harvest the margins. It's for the marginalized. It's for the people who need it. God commanded his people not to harvest their fields completely, but to leave some for the poor and needy who could come then and gather food in your field. And I, mean, I like to see this as God's welfare plan. It's a great one. I mean, think about this. God's way made it necessary for the poor and needy to work for their food, not just get a handout or a paycheck. You follow me? Sometimes I think, our government should read the Bible. Anyway, Ruth and Naomi are desperate, and they are trying to survive, and, and Ruth believes God is going to provide what we need, but there's a catch. It's in the field. 
I mean, God didn't deliver it through Amazon. I mean, it, there was no grocery store that they could go and get free groceries. They had to go work for it. God's provision becomes available when I do what God says. It's a true principle. So if Ruth was going to realize God's provision, if she was going to get in on what God was going to provide, then she had to quit moaning about her situation, which all of us do. She had to stop talking about, you know, what she couldn't do and didn't have and all of this. She needed to do what she could do with what she had, right? She needed to get active. So she goes out in the field. She's gleaning behind the harvest, but <laughs> she decided this, but she had to find the right field. I mean, think about this. While the law applies to everyone, not everybody abides by the law. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? Not everybody stops at the stop signs. You have to be careful of that, right, when you're at a four-way stop. You got to make sure that everybody's stopping before you go, right? Just recently, not too long ago, I was, I was at a, a signal light, and I was ready. I was, I was heading to the gym, and I was ready to go, and I was thinking about going to the gym and working out, and, and I was in the left turn lane, and I was just about ready to go, and my wife said, whoa, and whoom, a car went running right through the red light. And I would have been right in the impact zone. Thankfully, God stopped us. I believe that. But not everybody abides by the law, right? And, and I mean, think about this. Not everybody is going to be generous. Not everybody's going to be compassionate. Not everybody's going to want to share their stuff, their fields, with foreigners or the needy. Landowners would often break the law. Workers in the fields would often mistreat the poor people, especially women, especially foreigners. So Ruth didn't really know what to expect when she got out into the field. But in doing what God said, Ruth experienced God's plan. Listen to me. God can be trusted. If you do what God says, you will get in on what God is wanting to do in your life. Look what it says, verse 3. I love this. I want you to circle four words. Ready? Here we are. And as it happened. Come on, circle those on your outline. And as it happened. Say it with me. And as it happened. And as it happened. She found, Ruth found herself working in a field that belonged to, hell, here's our guy, Boaz, hero, champion, mighty warrior, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech, as it happened. Love this. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? It's a great phrase. The Hebrew words, and as it happened, the Hebrew words, the underlying phrase means this, her chance chanced. Everybody follow me on that? Basically, in other words, lucky her. What a coincidence. What good fortune. Ruth randomly picked the field that happened to belong to Boaz. Do you know that nowhere else in the Bible do we find a phrase like this? These are words of sarcasm. These are words of irony. These are words meant to, uh, to grab our attention. What appears to be chance and circumstance and fate and luck, guess what? It wasn't at all. We are witnessing what is called the providence of God. It's not, it's not mentioned in the book of Ruth, but it is all over the book of Ruth. God has his fingerprints all over what's going on in their lives. It's the theme of the entire book of, of Ruth. Sometimes God works through his visible hand of miracles, but most of the time in our lives, God works through his invisible hand of providence. When you follow him, he tells you he will bless you. He will move in your life. He will cause things to happen. Hmm. I mean, think about it. God puts us somewhere that we're supposed to be. Now, what's interesting about providence is we don't really see it. I mean, I, it's kind of funny, you know, it's almost like we're driving a car, and let's just imagine ourselves in a car, and we're at the, at the steering wheel, and we're driving, and most of the time, we're focused on what's in front of us, and we really don't see that God just did something. It's not until we look in the rearview mirror at our past that we realize, oh, wait, wait a minute. God put me there for a reason. I, I got into that class in college for a reason. I, I got that job for a reason, I came into contact with that person at the grocery store for, for a reason. I had that conversation or that person caught for a reason. Do, do, do you follow me? It's so important for us to see that God sometimes puts us there 
puts us where we're supposed to be. He introduces us to somebody that we're supposed to meet. He makes things happen. It's called providence. It's God's providence. Things don't just happen. Listen, when you follow God, things don't just happen. God is active. I love this new song that we just introduced today. Love it. Even when I don't see it. What? Yeah, it's working. He's working. Even when I don't feel it, he's working. You never stop. You never stop working. Wow. It's God's providence. Ruth came into the field because God guided her. God was working behind the scenes, and that's called providence. And that's the thing that we're going to see throughout this. Something we need to realize, I want you to get this down. God, God will put me in the right place if I obey him. Get that down on your outline. He will put you in the right place if you obey him. Now, Ruth could have ended up in anyone's field, but she didn't. I mean, God steered Ruth to the field of Boaz on that particular day. It doesn't mean that we don't have to make choices. It doesn't mean that we don't have to do something and take action. A lot of the times I meet people that say, I'm just praying that God will do this. And my question to them is, okay, but what are you doing? Because, see, God expects you to do what you can do, and the part that you can't do, God will do for you. That's the way it works. Um, Ruth could have ended up anywhere else, but because she obeyed and followed and took a step, she ended up in Boaz's field, and Ruth's choice became a pivot point, which changed everything in her life. The course of her life was affected here. Take a look. While she was there, look what it reads, verse 4, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. Now, I don't know if you see it here, but this is not just coincidence. The timing is amazing. She just happens to go to the field of Boaz to glean, to harvest what the harvesters are going to leave behind, and she just happens to go on the day when Boaz shows up on the, in the fields. Oh, wow. This is amazing. She picks the field. She's there when he's there. And look what happens. Boaz says, the Lord be with you to his workers. And the workers reply, the Lord bless you. I, I don't know if you have a boss that comes in and that's the first thing that comes out of their mouth on a Monday morning. God bless you. I hope you have a great day. I, that's, a, that's a good boss to work for. But then on the flip it, do you have employees that go, oh, God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. May, may God do great things in your life, boss. Wow. Wow. What a great company to work for. I'm in. Let's go, right? Okay. It says, then Boaz asked his foreman, now it gets a little serious, who is, who is that young woman over there? Who, who does she belong to? Boaz sees Ruth. He begins to wonder, hey, I didn't hire her. She's not on my payroll. Who is that? The foreman says, she's the young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. Obviously, everybody had heard about this scenario, right? She asked me this morning, the foreman says, she asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters, and she has been hard at work. Wait, okay, she has been hard. She's not asking for a handout. Can you you spare a couple of bucks? You got something to eat? Listen, if you know me, you know I'm not against reaching out to homeless people who have need. I'm not, I'm not against reaching out to anyone who has need. But I believe that sometimes, sometimes people milk the system. In this case, she was not one of those. Ruth is hard at work ever since the morning, except for a few minutes rest in the shelter. She's not looking for a handout. She's worked all day and listen to the first conversation that Boaz has with Ruth. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain. Don't go to any other fields. Stay right behind the women working in my field. See which part of the field they are harvesting and follow them. Now, I don't know if you realize what he's doing here, but he is providing friends for Ruth. He's he's not only protecting her, he's providing not only food, but now he's providing relationships. 
She's new to town. She doesn't know anyone. She's a foreigner. She's a widow. And he's saying, hey, these ladies that work for me, they are good people. I know. I hired them. They will be good influences in your life, good friends to you when you need people in your life. You need to hang out with these ladies. He is providing. And then look at what he says he he protects in verse 9. I have warned the young men. Notice this. He's like, hang out with the young ladies. They're good for you. But I've told the young men... (laughs) <laughs> not to treat you roughly. And when you're thirsty, help yourself to water that they have drawn from the well. Who has drawn? They, the men, the young men, have drawn from the well. Boaz probably got all his male employees together, and he kind of said, hey, guys, see that woman over there? Oh, yeah, boss, we see, yeah, see that woman right over there? Leave her alone. If you mess with her, you mess with me. Don't you hear this? I mean, I'm, I, maybe I'm just reading into this, okay? If you touch her, I own a big field and they will never find your body. I mean, that's kind of what I'm reading. I'm, I know I'm reading into this. That's all right. I'm kind of Old Testament that way. And so this is how it's going to roll, Boaz says. Don't mess with her. In fact, he says, you let her drink. When you draw water, you let her drink. Women are not here to serve us men. You serve her. Boaz shows himself as protector, provider. Boaz is the man. Now, I got to tell you, I'm saddened by something that that I feel is dying, if not dead at times in our culture. And guys, single guys in the room, young men, older guys in the room, I'm saddened when I don't see chivalry by men. Now, listen, I, I... I was raised to open doors for women. I was raised to yield my chair to women. And you say, oh, that's old school. Okay. I don't believe in chauvinism, but I believe in chivalry. Some women say, well, I just want guys to treat me like an equal. I understand the whole equality and the equal rights thing. I'm totally supportive of that. But ladies, do you really want a guy to treat you like another guy? Because... Men give each other wedgies and play pull my finger and other things like that. And I'm really sure that, ladies, that's not what you want from a guy. How about we view you ladies as equal? God created you as equal, but we treat you like a lady. With kindness and politeness and courtesy and love and affection and protection. Boaz helped Ruth find good friends. He makes sure no men are messing with her. And he does this because he is good and godly. That's the whole reason, the whole purpose. And in verse 10, Ruth falls at his feet and thanks him. She recognizes this in him. And she says, what have I done to deserve such kindness? I am only a foreigner. Boaz has extended such extreme kindness to her. And Ruth is saying, why? Why are you doing this? And how Boaz answers her question will determine the tone, I believe, for the greatest love story that we will ever come across. Take a look. Boaz says, yes, I know. I know you're a foreigner. I know you're a widow. I know your scenario. I've heard all about it. I know about everything that you have done for your mother-in-law, how you've stuck close, how you did not stay in Moab, but you came with her and you told her that your God will be my God and all that that's in Ruth chapter 1. I I know what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. I have heard how you left your father and mother and your own land to live here among complete strangers. Boaz is saying, Ruth, your reputation precedes you. It goes before you. You have been loyal. You've been committed to Naomi. You you are showing that you trust and obey God. You've left everything to come here and live among God's people. You are hardworking and wonderful. I respect and admire who you are and what you've done. And then he says, may the Lord, the God of Israel, hang on, she's a Moabite, remember? May the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge, reward you fully for what you have done. Man, wouldn't you want to have somebody bless you like that? That's good. And then in verse 14, it says, at lunchtime, Boaz called her and said, come over here, eat with us. Come to Rubio's with us, you know, that kind of thing. And and help yourselves to some of our food. So she sat with the harvesters. 
Wait, wait, wait. She, she's a foreigner. And here she is seated with Hebrews, Jewish people. Hmm. Not very kosher, right? Not in that day. And it says Boaz. Wait, who? Who served her? Boaz. Boaz gave her food. Look, I love this. More than she could eat. This, this is the beginning of the doggy bag, right here, right here in Scripture. We didn't know that, but it's here. She ate with the employees. Ruth was an outsider. Boaz was making her an insider. He was saying, you are accepted and you belong here. I want you to get that picture very clearly. And it says then in verse 15, when Ruth went back to work again, Boaz ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her. Wait, now it's like stepping up a level. Before it was just picking whatever is on the ground, and he was, he was saying, you know, just, just you, know, you know, let her take whatever's left over. He says, no, now, now let her take from the harvest. And then he says, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose for her. Right? Give her more. Well, boss, we're already, no, give her more. She needs more, give her more. Let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. Don't say anything to her. Don't give her grief. You let her take whatever she wants to take. This is way beyond following God's law. This this has stepped to a level of generosity, extreme generosity, that you and I, we really don't know. I mean, he is not only meeting her needs, he is blessing her above and beyond. He is overwhelming her with blessing. In fact, he's telling, I love this, he's telling his workers, you do the work for her. You pick it and then drop it, let her have it. In fact, I mean, it's kind of like you pick it, put it in her basket, not yours. Let her have it. Hmm. So Ruth gathered barley there all day. And when she had beat out the grain that evening, it filled an entire basket. Ruth takes advantage of the opportunity. I mean, she's working hard. God gives her this opportunity, goes into the field. She's working hard all day long. But the text says that she had an entire basket. Researchers and other versions of of Scripture tell us that it was like an ephah or a half bushel, which is equivalent, get this, to two weeks' wages for an average worker. How would you like to work one day and get a two-week paycheck? Huh? I'm in for that. And that's what she did. She went from starvation to making a living all in one day. That's what Boaz did. She carried it back to town, showed it to her mother-in-law. Naomi was wanting to know what was going on all day long. Where you been? All day. Ruth also gave her the leftover doggy bag, look at roasted grain that was left over from the meal. And she says, where did you gather all this grain? Where did, where did you go? Where did you work? May the Lord bless the one who has helped you. This is amazing. So Ruth told her mother-in-law about the man in whose field she had worked. And she said, the man I worked with today is named, come on, say it with me, Boaz. Oh, no, and Naomi's like, oh, Boaz. May the Lord bless him. He is showing kindness. Circle that word kindness. He's showing kindness to us as well as to your dead husband. You know what kindness is? It's what we talked about last week, kased. It's the overflowing love, grace, mercy, compassion of God. It's the kased. It's in, in his provision and in his providence, God is giving this amazing blessing of kindness to Ruth and Naomi. God's kased spills over into our lives, into the lives of those who follow him, and everyone around them, around you, is affected. If you're following God, God pours out his blessing, and it affects everyone around you. Listen, where you're working, if you're following God and doing what he says, guess what? Your job is being affected by what God is doing in your life, your family, your neighborhood. It's being affected. It, this, this is an amazing thing. Look what Naomi tells Ruth. That man, Boaz, is one of our closest relatives, one of our family, what is that word? Redeemers. Redeemer. Circle that word, redeemers. He, we are being introduced here to an important part of the book of Ruth. Redeemer comes from the ancient Hebrew word goel. In his law, God has made a way to provide for widows and their families. It's called the kinsman redeemer law. 
And this is what we see take place in the book of Ruth. Two passages really give us a clear understanding of how this works out. Deuteronomy 25, you might want to just jot these down. They're not on your outline. But Deuteronomy 25, God sets up a way for a kinsman redeemer to marry a widow and provide for her and continue the family line. In Leviticus 25, God sets up a way for a kinsman to redeem the family's uh, land so that the family does not remain poor and needy. So basically, a redeemer is responsible for the property and the people of the deceased person. And this is what we're seeing here. Naomi thought there was no hope for this. She had given up hope. She said, I'm bitter because I have nothing. There's, there's no hope for us. She even tried to send her both daughter-in-laws away because she said, there's no hope. Why would you stay with me? There's no hope. But she didn't know there was a Boaz. She didn't know there was a close relative on her husband's side that could provide hope. She didn't know about Boaz. Come back next week. We'll see how this plays out in Ruth 3. But to wrap off today, Ruth says, what's more, Boaz even told me to come back and stay with his harvesters until the entire harvest is completed. Huh. Naomi says, that's a good thing. He's a smart man. Do as he said, my daughter. Stay with his young women right through the, the whole harvest. You might be harassed in other fields, but you will be safe with him. Do you see what this is? It's going back to what I talked about in the beginning. Naomi is giving single Ruth family counsel. There it is. Just saying, hey, Ruth, this is God's plan. I didn't know it. I can't believe it. This is God's plan. Trust God. I mean, go in this direction. God has brought you and Boaz together. God has blessed this relationship. God has a future for you. Don't go anywhere else. Don't play the field. <laughs> Pun intended. Don't play the field. Stay with Boaz. So this is a confirmation through counsel from Naomi. And guess what? Ruth listens to counsel. Look. So Ruth worked alongside the women in Boaz's fields and gathered grain with them until the end of the barley harvest. Then she worked with them through the wheat harvest too. But all the while she lived with her mother-in-law. So Ruth, don't miss this, Ruth, she listened to counsel. She stayed close to Boaz's workers for the rest of the harvest while sharing a home living with Naomi. Once Ruth had been introduced to Boaz, you'd think that she would have immediately stepped into everything that God had, that everything would happen right away. But Ruth stayed and worked the entire season. You say, well, it's just one verse. I know, that's the problem. It's one verse that encompasses, hang on, six to eight weeks so we just read it as one verse and we think, oh, they went from Ruth chapter 2, 23 to now Ruth 3 where they're getting, you know, together. It didn't happen that way. Time happened. It was an entire harvest season. It's easy for us to, we lose timelines. When we read the Bible, we read one verse and we lose the timeline. This was a six to eight week period in one verse. Here's the kicker. There is no indicator of any other contact between Boaz and Ruth. That's the part to me that just, wow. I mean, there's, there's nothing recorded. Now, we don't know for sure what took place, and we can kind of read into this, but I mean, think about it. Every day, Ruth shows up to work in the fields, and nothing between her and Boaz is mentioned. There, there's nothing romantic reported between the two of them. They didn't text each other every hour and FaceTime every day. They didn't hang out every moment of every day. Ruth and Boaz gave it, hang on, time. Time to develop. 
They allowed for God's timing. They didn't rush things. They didn't push things along. And we have a tendency to do that, don't we? I mean, how many of you stand and watch the microwave timer go down and down and down? Hurry up. I want my whatever, you know, my burrito is in there. Come on, you know, right? We do that as if it's going to happen faster. See, this is, you, man, we got to get this. God's plan, God's confirmation, God's timing. Do you see that? God's plan, come on, say it with me. God's plan, God's confirmation, God's timing. Listen, she found God's plan, then it was confirmed by wise counsel, and then she waited on God's timing. Do you see how that works? We got to get this. Ruth trusted that God had brought her to Boaz. That's God's plan. Naomi told Ruth to stay in the field of Boaz. That's God's confirmation. Now Ruth had to trust that God knew what he was doing, even though it was not going as fast as she probably wanted it to go. That's God's timing. Get this down. God will orchestrate the right timing if I trust him. He will orchestrate it. He'll not only put you in the right place, but he will orchestrate the right timing if you trust him. God will cause things to work. God will cover the details and singles. God will bring you to the right person if you trust him. I wonder how many of us get ahead of God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever got ahead of God before? Have have, Have you ever got ahead of God in a romantic relationship before? I know that's, I mean... I don't mean to be focused on this, but I feel like this is the story goes here. I mean, we get too emotionally connected and involved too quick to somebody. We get too physically involved too quick with somebody. We move too fast or, you know, and, and, and it may not have even been God's plan, may or not. We don't know for sure. We just move too fast. It definitely wasn't God's timing. And guess what? It blows up in our face and we get hurt or we hurt somebody else. And that's not just in relationships, that's in all areas of our life, right? You say, well, Bart, I'm, I'm married, or I'm not, you know, looking to date, or, so it doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. God's timing will be there if you trust him. He'll put you in the right place if you obey him, but there's a whole other part of this, and it's timing. And you and I, we have to learn this. It's hard to slow down, isn't it? I mean, you that have been a part of Pathway Church for some time, you know that I have, a, I have a belief. I'll just tell it to you right here. I think God is slow. I do. He's slow according to my agenda and my time frame. I mean, he's slow. It's like, hurry up, man, God, come on, right? I want it now. I want it yesterday. But God is like, Bart, take a breath. Slow down, lower your blood pressure, (laughs) and let me do what only I can do in the timing that I have for you. Friends, we need to know God's plan. We need to have God's plan confirmed with wise counsel. And we need, you need, I need to wait on God's timing.